Hey everyone, lecture number three, three of four for this week. Uh, we left off talking about the American Revolution, and what I want to do is just quickly recap uh, some of what I was talking about with the American Revolution. Even though uh, we call the American Revolution a revolution, when we look at it in comparison with the French Revolution in Europe and then in the fourth lecture with the Haitian Revolution in the Caribbean and the Latin American Revolutions that come out of the Haitian Revolution, we notice that the American Revolution is a lot less revolutionary uh, than we might think it if we look at it by itself. It's an anti-colonial revolution, meaning that it's a revolution against monarchy and against empire. And in that facet, it does achieve its objective, right? There's a new nation created, the United States, which at least in 1783, when it was finally independent, uh, it was, didn't work that well. But by uh, 1800, and especially by 1812, the United States had established itself as an independent nation with a working financial system, a, a judicial system that upheld laws, and a governmental system that had survived some early troubles. But when we jump across the Atlantic, we'll notice that actually the United States, this new independent nation, doesn't look that different from the nation that it had independent that it had achieved independence from. The United States looked a lot like Great Britain. Its judicial system was almost exactly the same. Its financial system was pretty much the same. They were investing heavily in the Industrial Revolution and finance and infrastructure, just like Great Britain was. And governmentally, it looked very similar, too. Sure, there was no king, but this new presidential executive branch, legislative branch, and judicial branch was almost exactly the same setup as the British system, especially when you consider that Congress looked a lot like Parliament. Uh, and so the American Revolution actually when we compare it to other revolutions, is not that revolutionary. We'll focus in this lecture on the French Revolution, which is certainly more revolutionary than the American Revolution, especially because it has social origins and social outcomes. But it should also kind of ask you to, to draw up some questions when you consider how it began and, and what the outcomes are. The French Revolution begins as a uh, movement to overcome kind of the problems with the monarchical system in France, right? The king of France has too much power uh, and his powers are, are contested by the French people. But by the end of the revolution, you don't have a working system of government that looks totally different. Instead, you have almost the same system of government. In fact, you have an emperor, not the king or anyone from his family, a new emperor who's going on a mission to conquer all of Europe. Uh, and so we should ask ourselves like, wait a second, how does this happen? How did the snowball get rolling downhill, pick up so much steam that it couldn't be stopped. Um, so we really want to think comparatively here, right? How is the French Revolution different uh, than this American Revolution? And we're going to be in Europe. We're going to be in France mostly when we talk about this. But we actually have to start back with the American Revolution. Remember, one of our aspects, and the textbook does a good job of talking about this, one of our aspects of the Age of Revolutions is that they're all interconnected. And importantly, the French Revolution is inherently connected to the American Revolution. The Americans gained a very important ally in their war against Great Britain, and this was the French. Remember that the French had fought against the British during the Seven Years' War and lost. So when the American revolutionaries start this war against France, the King of France sees a great opportunity here. Nothing better to avenge their loss in the Seven Years' War than to strike back at the British who had defeated them. So the French, probably a bit unwisely, aid the American rebels uh, in their cause against Great Britain. Now, the French king isn't really thinking about this, right? Uh, he's not thinking that a revolution could happen within his own colonies. He's not necessarily worried that a revolution could begin within his own kingdom. Uh, he aids the Americans kind of just as a form of vengeance. But what he ultimately finds is that sending an army and a navy to the United States is incredibly taxing, right, in terms of real money. In total, the French crown probably spent the equivalent of 1.3 billion livres, right, this is the French currency, fighting the American Revolution. And this drives the French crown into a tremendous amount of debt. They had helped the Americans win their independence, but this new American nation is not rich. It's just getting started. Its financial system, which eventually will become incredibly profitable, isn't that profitable in the 1790s, or in 1800, or even 1815. And so the Americans don't really have the real currency to pay back the French for their support 
during the French Revolution. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the French king has to generate funds within his own country. So what he does is he calls a historic meeting of the three main groups of French citizens. This is called the Estates Generales, and it meets for the first time uh, since about two centuries before in 1789. And the king calls this historic Estates General because he has to pass a, a pass a new tax system. So in France, prior to 1789, the only group of citizens who was taxed were called the Third Estate. This Third Estate comprised 98% of the French population. The Third Estate was most everyone in France. The First Estate was the nobility, the Second Estate was the clergy, and the Third Estate were the commoners, that 98%. These were the only people taxed in France prior to 1789. But at the Estates Generales, the king proposes a new idea. He's not only going to raise the taxes on the commoners, on the Third Estate, he's also going to start taxing the Catholic Church, the clergy, and the nobility, people who had never been taxed before. And perhaps unsurprisingly, this is incredibly unpopular with not just the third estate, whose taxes are going up, but also the first and second estate, who are going to have to pay taxes for the first times. And what happens? The estate general is a total failure. All three estates are going to entirely protest the idea of being taxed. The first and second estate team up, and they say, listen, don't tax us. Tax the third estate more. The third estate, recognizing that they're going to be kind of the scapegoat for this whole tax process, protest the meeting of the Estates General either. They meet separately from the first and second estate and sign a new constitution that tries to reform the Estates General to give 98% of the French people a voice in the creation of not just the government, but also of tax systems. And you can see here a representation of the three estates. You see on the left, the clergy, in the middle, the nobility, and then on the far right, the third estate. Now, one thing you should not confuse here. The third estate is not common people, right? The, the voice of the third estate is really kind of the upper class, what they'll call bourgeoisie, right? These are the lawyers, the merchants, the bankers. They're not nobility, right? They're not titled people. Their name hasn't been handed down over generations. But they aren't poor either, right? Even though poor people are part of the third estate, the voice of the third estate are still kind of these elite third estate commoners. And what the Third Estate does is they entirely disband the Estates General and eventually create a new National Assembly, right? In a lot of ways, this new National Assembly is trying to replicate parts of the revolution that occurred in the United States. They want an increasing voice of the Third Estate, right? They want representation. They want a publicly elected legislator, people who pass laws based on common votes. And they also pass a very important Declaration of the Rights of Man. Now, this isn't a Declaration of Independence. One of those is passed in the United States. Instead, this declaration secures that men have certain unalienable rights, right? Something that Thomas Jefferson had noted, unalienable rights, except that the French don't just say their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They actually list a whole bunch of these rights that people are uh, entitled to naturally, right? All people, nobility, clergy, and commoners, third estate people, have certain rights. And part of your primary source uh, discussion assignment is to read this Declaration of Rights of Man. But what happens is this National Assembly gets divided into two different factions. There's one faction who says, listen, we can have a National Assembly, we can have a legislator popularly elected, and still keep the king. The other faction is far more radical. They say, out with the king, right? There's no place for monarchy. The entire government should be uh, popularly elected. The king makes no sense. A monarchy that's handed down over generations, totally illogical. And unfortunately for the king and for the more moderate faction of the National Assembly, the king of France has kind of really no idea what's going on, and he attempts to flee Paris in June of 1791 which makes him even more unpopular with the common people because they think he's fleeing, which he probably is, in order to gain support, in order to crush the National Assembly and bring back uh, the older form of government. Meanwhile, there's an increasing uh, famine occurring uh, within France, and there's this really dramatic 
march of women uh, to Versailles in a bread riot. And just like in the American Revolution, uh, French women, as the textbook points out again, are really important uh, to bringing about revolutionary change in France. Uh, women are important voices, they're boycotters, they're protesters, but just like American women uh, in the American Revolution, even though France promises the Declaration of the Rights of Man, it's not necessarily the Declaration of the Rights of Men and Women. And in the new French Republic that's created, just like in the new American Republic, women are often overlooked. They don't have political voices, economic voices, or their own um, rights outside of that of their husband or their fathers. But what happens is after the French king tries to flee, this radical faction uh, of the National Assembly is going to gain, gain tremendous amount of power. They're eventually going to get rid of all the pro-monarchy assemblymen. A lot of them will be beheaded. And eventually, as you can see in this painting here, even the king of France, King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette, are both going to be executed by this new kind of invention, the guillotine. And uh, the podcast I have you listen to this week is the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company. Uh, they're talking about this period where uh, objectors to this really radical version of republicanism and equality are going to be beheaded. And it brings up a really kind of interesting question, you know, what's the danger of democracy? What's the danger of republicanism? This reign of terror, which lasts uh, for a little bit, uh, almost a year, right? is going to see the execution of thousands, tens of thousands of people. The numbers are still really debated by historians, but we know that tens of thousands of people are going to be executed in the name of liberty and equality and fraternity, brotherhood, right? Uh, and so we kind of see a more dangerous element here. Think about how different this is in the American Revolution. Uh, independence is achieved and the early nation struggles, but there's no reign of terror. Right? There's no execution of tens of thousands uh, of, of dissenters. Instead, there's kind of this cooperation that occurs. It's not incredibly new government that's created, uh, but it's definitely spared this type of radical republicanism. And what's the outcome of this reign of terror? Well, eventually, only a couple of years after the reign of terror, one man who had been growing in importance during the reign uh, is Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte will uh, return from a uh, campaign as the reign of terror gets going, especially after the king of France is executed, monarchs from around Europe say, whoa, we've got to get involved, right? We have to stop this revolution in the name of terror in France. And so what the French do is they respond in turn. Armies uh, invade the surrounding countries uh, around France. French armies, right? These, these armies of the uh, National Republic are going to move east. Uh, and, and west into Spain, um, into uh, parts of what are now Germany, uh, the Italian peninsula, as, as far as Austria, uh, and also the north coast of Africa. Napoleon Bonaparte in particular is going to lead an army uh, into what is now Egypt. And the uh, French army is going to conquer really large regions of Europe, all in the name uh, of liberty and, and brotherhood. And they're going to try to bring the revolutionary ideas of France uh, to the rest of Europe. But when Napoleon returns from Egypt in 1799, he thinks that although the um, ideas of the revolution are, are important, uh, he could do a better job leading the country than the National Assembly could. And he'll eventually have himself, you can see this image in the bottom, and his wife Josephine crowned as the new emperor of France. So here you have a revolution that began against monarchy, that eventually had the monarch executed, then invaded the rest of Europe in the names of liberty, ending up with an emperor of Napoleon Bonaparte. So you can see just how radically different this is than the American Revolution. And Napoleon creates this massive empire. I mean, he conquers most of Europe uh, into Spain, as you can see, uh, all of France, all of the Rhine Confederation, all of uh, Italy, Austria. He makes a very big mistake, though. Uh, he makes a couple of them, but for the sake of this um, lecture, we're only going to focus on one. He tries to invade Russia. As you can see on this map, the Russian Empire did not fall uh, to the French. He tries to invade Russia during the winter, and even though he's incredibly successful, he has to retreat during uh, the Russian winter, and through his retreat, his army is decimated, ends up back in Europe uh, completely outnumbered, and he's defeated in 1815. And this brings the end to the, Amer uh, to the French Revolution, right? This emperor is now ousted, and a new uh, configuration of Europe is created. You'll notice France isn't really punished. It maintains its original kind of borders. This new German confederation is created. Russia is greatly expanded. Austrian Empire is expanded. This Congress of Vienna, which we'll talk about in later lectures, is the new organization of Europe that actually looks a lot like Westphalia.
So you can see how different the French Revolution was than the American Revolution.